on World News Tonight. Deadly protests. French police clash with anarchists after May Day rallies turn violent. Scary predictions. Experts say El Nino will lead to even harsher summer weathers ahead. Conflict escalates. The United Nations warns of more people leaving Sudan prompting a possible migrant crisis. Met Gala 2023. Hollywood stars and artists grace the red carpet in this year's prestigious Met Gala event. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers tonight. Now, as International Labor Day was celebrated yesterday, the chaos in France flared up. French police clashed with hundreds of black-clad anarchists in Paris and other cities during union-led protests against President Emmanuel Macron's increase in the retirement age as workers staged Labor Day rallies across Europe. Fires raged on city streets across France during May Day rallies Monday as black-clad anarchists clashed with police during union-led protests against French President Emmanuel Macron's controversial pension reform. In some areas, demonstrators pelted French police with Molotov cocktails and fireworks. Then, police were booed as they responded with tear gas. In Lyon, riot police were seen retreating on a bridge as projectiles were thrown. In another location, they were seen charging forward. Anarchists also clashed with riot police in the city of Nantes in front of regional offices and local administration buildings, some of which were burned. About 200 people were arrested, officials say, as hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in protest after Macron last month raised the retirement age by two years to 64, despite widespread and multi-sector strikes. The reform, which Macron says is necessary to protect the health of the pension budget, will be implemented gradually starting on September 1st. But protesters like Clara Bossard say Macron overstepped. Trade unions had called for a big May Day turnout as they attempt to force a U-turn by Macron's government, which forced its pension law through without a final vote in the National Assembly. Opinion polls show a substantial majority of French people oppose the higher retirement age. And many workers say an out-of-touch Macron is indifferent to their daily hardships. Over to the escalating violence in Sudan. The United Nations was warning that 800,000 people may flee Sudan as rival military factions battle in the capital, despite a supposed ceasefire. Drone footage obtained shows a massive pillar of smoke bellowing over the Sudanese capital, Khartoum, on Monday after airstrikes and artillery attacks. The United Nations on Monday warned the conflict in Africa's third most populous nation could force 800,000 people to flee into neighboring countries. Sudan's UN humanitarian coordinator, Abdu Dieng, warned of a, quote, full-blown catastrophe. As you know, it has been more than two weeks of devastating fighting in Sudan, a conflict that is turning Sudan humanitarian crisis into a full-blown catastrophe. Hundreds of people have been killed and thousands wounded in battles that erupted between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, in the middle of April. Foreign governments have pulled out their citizens over the past week in a series of operations by air, sea and land. Among them was Noor Kulab, who moved to Sudan eight years ago to study medicine and was evacuated back to her home in the Gaza Strip just before she was supposed to graduate. It was horror. When you see bodies scattered right and left, dismembered people, torched banks, you feel it is totally unsafe. I felt like the future was on hold and all my hard work while I was away from home disappeared in a glimpse. And in one day, all my hard work during eight years has gone. Sudanese civilians have fled into neighboring countries by the tens of thousands, raising fears the crisis could exacerbate regional instability. Civilians continue to flee the fighting. Many of them are taking refuge in areas of the country that have not been as much affected by the, the regional spillover effect of the crisis is of, of a serious concern. Sudan's army chief and the head of the RSF had shared control of government after a 2021 coup. 
but fell out over a planned transition to civilian rule. Both sides agreed on Sunday to extend a truce by 72 hours, and the UN told they may hold truce talks in Saudi Arabia. But that truce has been interrupted by gunfire and artillery. U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Kevin McCarthy visited Israel and he addressed the parliament and said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu should be invited to the White House for an official visit following months without an invitation from Washington. Kevin McCarthy takes to the lectern before Israel's Knesset, an honor accorded to few American politicians and only one other House speaker in history. God bless Israel. God bless America and God bless our special relationship for the next 75 years. As Israel celebrates its 75th anniversary, relations between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and American President Joe Biden are fraught. The most right-wing government in Israel's history is planning a controversial overhaul to the judicial system, drawing rare condemnation from Biden. The Israeli Prime Minister is usually invited to the White House soon after being elected, but it's been five months and Netanyahu still hasn't been. Republican McCarthy promised to have words with Democratic Biden. I know we've had a lot of different leaders coming to America. I expect the White House to invite the Prime Minister over for a meeting. Full of praise, Netanyahu framed McCarthy's visit as bipartisan. Israel. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, he has uh, been a champion of uh, the Israeli-American alliance. I think we have no better friend. You've brought with you a bipartisan delegation to express uh, solidarity with Israel on its 75th anniversary. The visit came as Israeli MPs returned from a month-long break. An opposition politician says no progress has been made on the judicial overhaul, which would, for instance, allow the government to name Supreme Court judges. The law was put on hold after some of the biggest protests ever seen in Israel. Donald Trump's defense attorney wrapped up his cross-examination of a writer, Jean Carroll, in the trial over her rape allegation against the former president, asking her about old Facebook posts in which she said she was a massive fan of his reality show, The Apprentice. Back on the stand, E. Jean Carroll facing a second day of intense cross-examination. Joe Takapina, an attorney for the former president, doubling down on the defense theory that Carol made up her sexual assault accusation against Mr. Trump to gain notoriety, where she describes bumping into Mr. Trump at Bergdorf Goodman and helping him pick out a gift. Today, Carol told the jury it was such a New York story and such a happy story. And then, of course, it turned tragic. She says the former president raped her in the dressing room, an allegation the defense again tried to undermine Monday by saying she never called the police, despite having told others in her advice column to do so. Carol explaining in court, I'm a member of the silent generation. Women like me were taught and trained to keep our chins up and to not complain. Takapina also confronting Carol with old posts on Facebook years after she says she was assaulted, where she calls herself a, quote, massive fan of Mr. Trump's TV show, The Apprentice. But Carol told the jury she also made several jokes about him. Today, Mr. Trump visited Scotland. It appears unlikely he'll show up at trial. Still on U.S. news, the troubled First Republic Bank has now been taken over by J.P. Morgan Chase. First Republic is the third U.S. bank to fall victim to the recent banking crisis, but there are hopes that this takeover will bring the crisis to an end. San Francisco-based First Republic Bank, which had been the 14th biggest commercial bank in the U.S. last year, has been sold to banking giant J.P. Morgan Chase after being taken over by financial regulators. On Monday local time, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation announced that it has seized First Republic and that J.P. Morgan Chase will be purchasing all of the troubled bank's deposits and assets. According to the FDIC, as of April 13th, First Republic had approximately $229.1 billion in total assets and $103.9 billion in total deposits. Following the announcement, U.S. President Joe Biden greatly welcomed the deal. I'm pleased to say that the Regulators have taken action to facilitate the sale of First Republic Bank and ensure that all depositors are protected and the taxpayers are not on the hook. This comes a few days after First Republic reported losing about 40 percent of its deposits in the first quarter of this year. 
depositors started losing confidence in the bank, pulling out their money after witnessing the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in March. Despite a $30 billion rescue package from 11 banks in mid-March, the situation worsened, with the bank's stock falling more than 75 percent last week. After a rocky few months for the U.S. banking sector, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon told analysts over the phone that though there are chances that another smaller bank may fail, Monday's takeover has pretty much ended the current banking crisis. With Monday's takeover, all 84 First Republic offices across eight U.S. states are reopening as J.P. Morgan branches. Going into a short commercial break now, more news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, La Nina climate pattern will finally come to an end this month after three years of unusual long period. But the end of the La Nina will be followed by the start of El Nino, which experts say will lead to even harsher summer weather ahead. Roads flooded by record-breaking rainfall in Pakistan. Entire villages in Germany covered in driftwood and garbage after the country's biggest rainfall in 100 years. India seeing temperatures close to 50 degrees Celsius in the month of April. All of this as a result of an unusually long period of the La Nina, oceanic and atmospheric climate pattern that has lasted for three years. La Nina refers to the periodic cooling of ocean surface temperatures in the central and east central equatorial Pacific that usually lasts for 9 to 12 months but the recent cycle started in August 2020. And as such, the heat imbalance spreading from oceans into the atmosphere can cause global disasters. While weather experts have predicted a transition to the El Nino climate pattern in June, the phenomenon is set to begin a month earlier as the water temperature in the monitoring area rose sharply last month. And according to simulations, by September, water temperatures could rise by more than 1.5 degrees compared to a normal year, resulting in a stronger El Nino. Weather experts in South Korea are closely monitoring the effects of the new El Nino cycle. When El Nino develops during the summer season, the expansion of the high pressure that drives the heat in Korea is delayed. This means the rainy season and intense heat also start late, and southern regions could see frequent heavy rain. And now, what seemed to be an end of unusual weather patterns due to the prolonged La Nina could actually be the beginning of more unsettled weather ahead of the start of El Nino. As he dons his regalia, the coronation glove that King Charles III will use will be the one made for and worn by his grandfather, King George VI, for his coronation. The glove and its duplicate were made by dents with embroidery by Edward Stilwell and company. The original glove, the one Charles will wear, has been kept in royal collection while the identical duplicate is in the dents museum on loan for the worshipful company of glovers. Looking at the duplicate, Moore commented on the beautiful gold embroidery made from gilt metal thread, wire and spangles. The glove, which covers the hand, wrist and part of the forearm, is made from white kid leather and is lined in red silk satin. Moore explained that two identical coronation gloves are always made, just in case. Since it was established in 1777, Dents had made hand-cut gloves and other leather goods with a team of skilled workers who is to this date cut, sew and stitch. Breaking from finishing off a glove, 69-year-old Sally Norris, who is the factory forelady, said that it was exciting to see the glove Charles will use. Den supported the conversation of the glove that Charles will use, which was presented to the king by the worshipful company of glovers. Made in 1937, their now closed Worcester factory, Moore said that the glove would probably have taken two or three days to make. King Charles III will wear the glove on his right hand to hold the sovereign's scepter with cross when he is crowned. And it will be 90-year-old Lord Singh of Wimbledon, a crossbench peer born in Rawalpindi, who gets to carry the glove to the coronation on the 6th of May. 
Australia's flagship career, Qantas Airways, has named Finance Chief Vanessa Hudson as its next chief executive officer, making her the first woman to lead the century-old airline. Hudson will also make November take over from Alan Joyce, whose 15 years in the job has made him one of the longest-serving CEOs of a major Australian company and a high-profile figure in the global aviation industry. Australia's largest airline, Qantas, has picked a woman to be its new CEO. Vanessa Hudson is set to take over from current CEO Alan Joyce in November. I am so passionate about Qantas. I've worked for Qantas for, for 28 years. Hudson joined Qantas in 1994 and has held several senior roles there, including Chief Financial Officer and Chief Customer Officer. Qantas's chairman said her outstanding handling of the finance and treasury portfolio during the COVID crisis put her ahead of dozens of other candidates shortlisted for the job. We are in an incredibly uh, strong position. We've got many things uh, in the pipeline. Uh, that's not to say that the past three years haven't been challenging. They have, and there will be many challenges, I'm sure, ahead. But my focus uh, when I step into the role in November is going to be focused on delivering for our customers. Hudson's appointment makes her one of the few female executives leading a major company in Australia. Although rival carrier Virgin Australia also has a woman CEO. She replaces Joyce, who has been in the role for 15 years. There's not many uh, female CEOs in the worldwide aviation industry. And it's a credit to this country that a gay Irish man was appointed uh, 15 years ago to be CEO of the company. And now we have the first female and it's a credit to the board. The airline faced a reputational crisis during the pandemic for flight cancellations, cutting jobs and accepting financial support from the government. The 2023 Met Gala kicked off on a high note at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City as the red carpet was bursting with fabulous and fierce style moments from a sea of black and white designs to the overtop accessories and bold beauty looks and there's no shortage of glitzy and glamorous get-ups. This year's theme honored the late Karl Lagerfeld who during his six decade career designed haute couture for some of fashion's biggest names like Chloe. Fendi and Chanel. Some stars making bold fashion statements to honor the legend. Rapper Bad Bunny embracing Lagerfeld's aesthetic in a monochromatic white suit with the 26 foot long flower train. Cardi B also donning a white wig and black floral dress. Lagerfeld famously had a feline named Choupette. So many on tonight's catwalk paying tribute, including musician Lil Nas X and his glittery number. Actor Jared Leto, both before and after he took off his monster cat costume. And rapper Doja Cat. WNBA star Brittany Griner, recently freed after being detained in Russia for nearly 10 months, walked the red carpet with her wife Sherelle. Priyanka Chopra and hubby Nick Jonas, Jennifer Lopez, Pedro Pascal, Mary J. Blythe, Kim Kardashian, Viola Davis, and newly minted Oscar winner Michelle Yeoh. Tennis legend Serena Williams and model Carly Kloss making bold fashion statements and revealing baby bumps. A very pregnant Rihanna arrived nearly two hours late wearing a white Valentino dress covered in Chanel's iconic camellia flower. Her partner, ASAP Rocky, wore a kilt. <laughs> But the biggest star of the night may have been the cockroach that appeared on the white carpet. Get a photo! Receiving the paparazzi treatment and sending Twitter into overdrive. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. President Joe Biden told his counterpart Ferdinand Marcus Jr. that the U.S. commitment to the defense of its ally was ironclad, including the South China Sea, where Manila is under pressure from China. Three crew members of a Gabon-registered tanker were missing after the vessel caught fire off Malaysia's southern coast. 
The tanker was on its way to China to Singapore with 28 crew members on board, the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency said, adding that 23 were rescued by the MMEA and by nearby vessels. Mercedes-Benz has plunged its Formula One team into the engineering process to build vastly more efficient mass-market electric vehicles and slash product-led times by 25% or more to jumpstart its effort to take over Tesla. According to HPP Advanced Technology Director Adam Holsop, F1 technology has always eventually bled over into mass-market vehicles, but Mercedes's direct collaboration approach to build more efficient EVs faster is unprecedented. The bodies of seven people, including two missing teens and a convicted sex offender, were found on a property near the small Oklahoma city of Henrietta. The county issued an amber alert earlier saying that the two teens were missing, but the alert was called off after the bodies were found. Colombia's President Gustavo Petro demanded during his May speech that people stay awake and combative to support his raft of reforms that prompted a government reshuffle and the appointment of new cabinet ministers. Pedro addressed the crowds gathered in front of the Narino Palace to demand them to stay up to defend his labor, pension and health needs. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we ended off tonight's broadcast with visuals of this year's Met Gala event where stars and artists dazzle the red carpet. Stay safe and have a good night.